All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to day two of the gathering. We're so glad that you're here. We loved all the connecting that began to happen last night and just going to continue in to today. We hope you got a little bit of rest last night and you're ready for a great day today. I just want to make mention that if you have not gotten your messenger card, if you're here as a messenger that is a representative from your church family, as a full voting member church family, if you've not gotten your messenger card, then you can see Vaughn, and uh, Vaughn is going to be in the foyer. She's right behind that window there talking to Chad. She will help you with that. If you think you're a messenger, but you're not sure, go talk to Vaughn, okay? Um, because we're going to do our business portion um, at the end of our morning today, all right? And you're going to need that card. You will need that messenger card to do the voting, all right. Would you guys allow me just to open us up in a word of prayer? And then Carl and the team, they're going to just use the skills and the talents that God has given them to usher us into worship, because that's how we want to start today. We want to start by just singing and having a time of directed, focused prayer together. And then we're going to hear from the president of our convention, J.D. Fasolino. He's going to share from God's word with us today. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for the sunshine. God, thank you that you not only created the world. God, you sent your only son into this world as a servant, as a baby. Growing up, facing every temptation, facing every challenge, and doing it free from sin, providing the only way, the only way for a restored relationship with you that we broke. So today we say thank you. We ask that you would prepare our hearts and our minds, God, to, to give you worship that only you're worthy of. Father, we pray that you would speak, speak into the hearts of every person that's gathered here. God, thank you for those that are caring for the children last night, today, and tonight. Father, would you plant seeds of your truth in those kids, seeds of truth in us? Because, God, we want to follow you. Lord, would you be honored and glorified? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, I'm going to ask you guys to stand with us as we worship this morning. We are so glad to be here. Uh, we're so glad to be part of this uh, this time of focusing on God and gathering together as a spiritual community. Uh, we want to use this opportunity to focus in and uh, begin this day on the right foot, honoring the name of Jesus. So I'm going to ask that you sing with us, the Lion and the Lamb.
his face And I see
last song this morning, I think about why we're here, gathering together to honor the name of Jesus, but not just to gather, but to go. To me, the point is not that we came here, it's what we do after. It's what we do when we leave this room. Our next song is a prayer. Make me more like Jesus. It will not work if you go on your own strength. It will not work if you work with your own plan. Jesus does the work, and we offer ourselves to him. This prayer to be more like Jesus is our only weapon in the world of darkness, to be more like him, the light. you 
What a great morning of worship already, hasn't it been? Awesome. We had a, a, already a full week with Sun Network Gathering. We worshiped in a great big room with lights and bands. But I tell you, last night was off the charts in here, wasn't it? So thank you, Carl and David and Rob and drummer boy. I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> but uh, Eric, uh, but you guys led us so well. Thank you. Let's show our appreciation. Oh, we don't, they didn't do it for this. Let's show our appreciation. It's our honor to, uh, to lead us in a time of prayer as we seek the Lord. We've just sung to the Lord, and I know we've meant it from our hearts. And now we get to corporately seek the Lord together and to get low before him and to call upon him to, to be present with us and to do in us and through us what only he can. And so we're going to lead you in a time of, of corporate prayer uh, this morning. And uh, what a great time again last night to honor all that's happened in the past as we've uh, seen the foundation of where we stand on the shoulders of great men and women who've gone before us. Thank you for leading us so well last night. What a, what a privilege to know that. God, only God did it in the past, amen? Only God did it in the past. But we believe this morning that, that we look forward to, also with anticipation, what God is going to do in the future. Only God did it in the past. Only God can do it into the future. And so that's why we come to him with an earnest desire to seek him and to pray and ask him to join us as we join him in what he is doing in the world. And so we're going to seek the Lord today. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Exodus chapter 33. Exodus 33, it's one of those passages that keeps uh, coming back to me over and over in life. And honestly, the older I get, the more life I live, it doesn't become less important. It becomes more important. And I have a greater longing uh, to see what is happening in Exodus 33 come alive in our hearts. And uh, as we pray today, uh, I just want to uh, set this up with just a quick understanding of where we are. Exodus 32, we know, is the golden calf. Israel at their lowest. At their lowest, we're not there by God's grace, but they were there. Exodus 33 then, God's kind of tired of it, and he's done with them. He says, you know what, you guys can go, but I'm not going with you. Go ahead. You can do your thing, but I'm not going with you. Again, we weren't there, but I think we're here where Moses picks up, and Joshua picks up with an earnest longing for, hey God, if you're not going with us, we are not going to go. We need one thing and one thing alone in this journey. It is God himself. Not things from God, it's God. Amen? So here's where we pick it up in verse 7. Now Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, far off from the camp, and he called it the tent of meeting. And everyone who sought the Lord would go out to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. Whenever Moses went out of the tent, all the people would rise up, and each would stand at his tent door and watch Moses until he'd gone into the tent. When Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent, and the Lord would speak with Moses. I underline this. The Lord would speak with Moses. And when the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people would rise up and worship. They'd rise and worship each of the, his tent door. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. When Moses turned again to the camp, his assistant Joshua, son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. And I don't know already, but the, the, you see in this text, it's this longing. There's a longing. There's a, an earnest longing for God, for a meeting with God himself. Not another conference. I know we love conferences. Not another tool, but a meeting with God himself. That's where we want to start this morning. Longing for God. We See what God's done in the past 10 years? Man, can you imagine what God's going to do in the next 10 years? But it starts with a longing for more of God himself. And then he goes on to say this. 
Moses said to the Lord, See, you said to me, bring up his people, but you've not let me know whom you'll send with me. You've said, I know you by name. You've also found favor in my, my sight. Now, therefore, if I found favor in your sight, please show me now your ways, why, that I might know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. And God said to him, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And he said to him, If your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not in your going with us, that, that, so that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people in the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, This very thing that you have spoken, I will do, for you have, for I, you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Now Moses said these words, we're going to end here, Show me your glory. That's what we long for in CNBC, isn't it, more than anything? Not bigger churches, not better churches, the glory of the Lord to be upon us and among us and to show himself through us. And that's what we're going to pray this morning over the next 10 minutes in little groups. Ruth's going to lead us in the first section, but in little groups, uh, we're going to pray for some specific things. And basically what we want to pray is, God, we need you more than anything else. I want to read you one quote before I give the mic to Ruth. Uh, it's Ian e. Bounds, a man who penned this over 120 years ago, but so applicable today. When he's talking about prayer, I just want to inspire you to pray. Here's what he says. What the church needs today is not more or better machinery. This is 120 years ago. Not new organizations or more novel methods. She needs men and women whom the Holy Spirit can use. Men and women of prayer, mighty men and women in prayer. The Holy Spirit does not flow through methods, but through men and women. He does not come on machinery or technology, but on men and women. He does not anoint plans, but men and women, but yet men and women of prayer. So as we long for what God could do, it starts with us on our knees. Every great movement of God started in one place. They study revival, started in one place. God's people on their faces, earnestly, diligently seeking him for him alone. So we're just going to lead us in the first section of prayer. All right. So as you can see, uh, there are three points to this. The first one being repent, turning to Jesus, acknowledge our desperate need for God, and determine to only go if he goes with us. Uh, as we look at the first one, the repent, um, we always know that when we have sin in our lives, it prevents us from really experiencing the fullness of God's presence because of our sin, it, right? It, we feel kind of embarrassed and ashamed of ourselves. And uh, when I read 33 and I read that part where God says, I'm going to consume you because he was so mad with their stiff-necked attitudes of the Israelite people, it made me stop to think, ooh, let's make sure our hearts are in the right place. So this morning when we pray, Let's spend some time maybe repenting of things that, that are in our hearts and preventing us from truly experiencing all that God has for us and all of who he is. Then the second thing, acknowledging. So in verse 13, we see Moses and he says, um, Now, therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me now your ways that I may know you in order to find favor favor in your sight. And those words, please, really stuck out to me like he's begging. I need you, God. I desperately need you because you are who you say you are. So in the repent, you almost get the sense of I should not go. And then in the acknowledge part, you get a sense of I can't go. I just need you so much. And he's begging and begging God, please. And he doesn't say, show me in the next little while. He says now, like I want it now. And so we can come boldly before God and we say, show us your presence, O Lord God. We want to see you in everything that we do and in every step that we go. And, and I think of the attributes of God, God's holiness, God's purity, God's perfectness. He is so good and loving and patient, all those wonderful things. So as we pray through, acknowledge, let's think of the attributes of God as well. And then the third thing, to determine, uh, to only go if he goes with us. And uh, in this sense, it's, I will only go if you go with me, right? So the first two is, I shouldn't go, I can't go, but this one's, I'm only going to go if you go. I will go, but with you. And it makes me think of uh, kids when they're little, right? They're scared of the dark, and they don't want to go to the basement, or they might not want to go to bed by themselves because they're scared of something lurking in the darkness. And they're very stubborn. I know our, our youngest is definitely in that category. And he will stand firm and say, I am not going in the basement if you're not coming with me. Right? It's, and it's that right there that Moses is standing firm, almost like, you're my father. I need you. I can't go without you. 
I know that you're going to bring me peace. You're going to be giving me the assurance that I need, and you're also going to provide all that I need. So he stands his ground, and he says, I'm not going. You come. And it's interesting because twice God says to him, so verse 14, if you look at verse 14, it says, and he said, so this is God speaking to Moses, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Then you keep going in verse uh, 15, and he said to him, so this is Moses again saying, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. So God just told him, I'm going to be there, but he needs that assurance again. So then we look down at verse 17, and God's so patient and so loving. He says, this very thing that I have spoken to you, I will do, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. So we can come to God and say, I'm not going without you, and it's okay. God says, I'm going to be there. I will be with you. So let's pray and with determination, acknowledging who God is and also repenting in our hearts. If you want to get in little groups of two or three or four, and let's just get on your knees if you want. You can stand up. But let's spend a good five, six minutes just seeking the Lord together, and then we'll come and lead you in the next section.
God, we thank you that we can come together as a group of people and express our desperation for you. God, we are desperate for you. We, we long for you, God. And not only do we, are we desperate for you, though, today, God, we, we also want you more than anyone or anything else. We know, Lord, that you're the difference maker uh, in our lives, in our churches, in our communities, in our country. So, God, grow within us a deeper longing and desperation for you. In Jesus' name, amen. In the next section here, we're just going to pray. First, we pray, Lord, we need you. Now we're going to pray, Lord, we want all of you. It's just four simple words, but they're powerful words. I think the most powerful words in Scripture is just this. Show me your glory. Show me your glory. Really what Moses is saying is, God, we want all of you. Here's three things we're going to pray now in the next few minutes. Uh, Lord, captivate us, overwhelm us, and astound us. This is a dangerous prayer for no one can see God and live, right? But yeah, Moses is like, I just, I just need more of God. I need all of God. And so, Lord, captivate us. Fill us with the wonder and an awe of who you are. Lord, show us the fullness of your majesty, your power, your dominion in our lives, in our churches, communities, and country. God, overwhelm us. We refuse to be content with part of you, God. We want all of you. How often do you find yourself just content with just a little bit of God? Because the world's so enticing. But yeah, we want all of God. Nothing more, nothing less. Lord, you can have all of us. At the same time, if we're going to have all of God, he needs to have all of us, our dreams, our desires, our plans, our agendas. Here's a word, we surrender, I surrender. And then Lord, astound us, just show me your glory. This is what it all captured in this one phrase, show me your glory. Lord, accomplish in us and through us the fullness of what only you can do. This is God showing us his glory. Lord, make your glory be known in every church, in every community, in every part of Canada. Lord, Lord show us your glory. Wouldn't it be awesome if God just showed us his glory in Canada? That's definition of revival right there. Not bigger churches. Not more things to do. God just shows his glory to every part of Canada. Let's just say, let's just pray those four words. Show us your glory. Whatever that means to you, if these are prompts that will help you, great. If they're not, just toss them out and pray according to the way the Lord, the way the Spirit leads you. But this is the prayer. I know it's a longing of your heart and my heart, isn't it? Lord, show me your glory. Let's pray. Bam, let's pray.
Heavenly Father, we, we bow before you today, thanking you for this time. Thank you for the honor and the privilege that we can approach your throne with all confidence because of our great high priest, Jesus. Thank you, God, that you lead us. Thank you that you never, you never leave us or forsake us and that you are a good shepherd who leads us on the paths of righteousness. That even when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we don't have to fear evil. That, God, we can pray according to your truth to say, God, take all of me. Or sometimes I, we don't even know what we say when we say that. But, Lord, I pray that it would be the heart, the, the cry of our hearts. Because, Lord, that's what we've said when we surrender to you. It's all yours. Father, we pray for J.D. God, thank you for how he leads. And God, we pray, Lord, you have put your message in his heart, and we pray for him that he would be your mouthpiece this morning. God, use him. Use your word. God, it would be honoring to you. And Father, I pray that our hearts would be open to hear what you have to say to each of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Buenos dias. Good morning. Espero que hayan tenido una noche buena. I, I hope you have had a great night. I'm going to switch to English. I just want to make people nervous thinking that I was going to take double the time. So. But I can say this. I am nervous. And, and it's great because that showed us that we are desperate for God in that we need to be that way, desperate for God. And let me start by saying something that uh, I really feel. I am thankful. I am honored. It is a privilege to be standing up here, especially in such a time like this. It is a privilege, it has been an honor to be an active member of our CNBC family in such a time like this. We have had uh, great years as a convention. God has done great things through us and in us. No doubt about it. But we heard uh, our executive director last night. There's no doubt that we have great days ahead, that we are facing great days. This vision that we as a convention have is a kingdom gospel movement. Kingdom is our mission, gospel is our message, and the movement is our mandate. We are disciples, and a disciple is that who makes disciples. He's a follower, but he's a follower that knows, that knows what to do. And for me, for the past weeks and months, when I've been considering this, when I've been uh, thinking about this, there's a, there's a passage that comes to mind. There's a passage that I, that I have been reading, uh, deep in studying it. It's a passage that I just shared with uh, our national leader board in our last meeting. And it's uh, John 13. And I want to take time today to, to reflect on this passage once again now alongside you, alongside our CNBC family. If you can look at uh, John 13, 
And, and you may know the story, the story of Jesus washing the disciples' feet. And, and this morning, I, I want us to go and read verse 12 to 17. Can I ask you to stand up? John 13, verse 12 to 17 says, When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do, just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Father, thank you for having us here this morning. Thank you for your presence in this place. We come before you to, to worship you, to give you all the glory that you deserve, all the glory that belongs to you and you only. Father, this is your word. Can you please speak to us? Speak not only to, to our minds, but to our hearts. Thank you, Father. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. You may know the context of the passage we just read. Um, it's a story that you may have read, that you may have uh, heard about it. Some of you may have preached about it. <clears throat> and it's a story that, as we just read in verse 12, it is Jesus washing his disciples' feet. Actually, I said it wrong because if you read the title on our Bible, it says, The Disciples' Feet. So he even washed the feet of the one that he was not his disciple. He washed their feet. And this is something for that this is something that for some of us it does not make much sense if we are honest. But you know that Jesus is doing what he does best. He's teaching by his example. He's giving us an example. I, I, I can only imagine that moment. I can only imagine what was, ha what was happening in, uh, in the minds of the disciples, their faces. No, no wonder why in, in verse 12, Jesus needed to ask, do you understand what I have done to you? And it looks like he didn't even wait for the answer. We don't know. But then in verse 13, 14, he said some things. And, and if you read uh, verse 15, he gives the answer. Do you understand what I have done to you? I have given you an example. And it's good that he didn't wait for an answer. Sometimes when, when we look after God, we look after God wanting him to give us the answer that we are looking for. And he asked, do you understand what I have done to you? And, and let me start, stop here for a, for a couple of minutes. And, and let me ask you this. Do you know what is the most difficult part of studying the Bible? And I'm not looking for an answer because we can have as many answers <laughs> as many people when we are here. But if you ask me, it's a personal application. 
when you take what you are learning from the Bible, from the truth of God, and put it into practice. That's the most difficult part in the Bible. That's the most difficult thing to do. We always say that the Bible is not about information, but transformation. And, and that's the way Jesus taught. That's the way Jesus taught through personal application. And when we continue reading the text, verses 16 says, Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. And then comes verse 17, my favorite verse. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. So a great question we should ask the text here will be, what things is Jesus referring to? Because these are things that apparently we know. These are things that apparently uh, we may understand. And, and if I know them, if I understand them, I will be blessed by doing it. Actually, these, these things started with the question, do you understand what I have done to you? Let me stop there for like 15 seconds. Because the question is, do you understand what I have done to you? Not for you. We do understand what he has done for us. A month ago, we celebrated a resurrection. We do understand many things that he has done for us. But do we understand what he has done to us? And you may say, well, Jesus hasn't washed my feet. And you are correct. He has done far more to us. He made us in his own image. Genesis 1.27. He made us his children, and because we are his children, we are his hers, Romans 8, 17. He made us his disciples to go and do what he has taught us. And because of that, because of the things that he has done to us, we ought to do the same to others. You know, he gave us the example to not only live our lives the way he wants us to live, but he gave us an example on how to do things to others. That is actually literally what Jesus is saying in his answer in, in verse 15. Please go and, and, and look at your Bible and read verse 15, it says, For I have given you an example that you sh also should do just as I have done to you. I, I want to make a statement, and, I and I'm pretty sure we all know this. We all know that knowing the word of God is not enough. We all may know that. May know that. But we also need to understand that uh, just doing what Jesus is telling us to do isn't enough. Because we need, we need to know his word, yes. We need to do the things that he has calling us to do, yes. But we need to do it his way, not ours following his example, know what we know, what we understand, the way we think we can do things. 
I had to learn this 10 years ago when I first came to Canada. I was challenged to plant a Hispanic church. I can do that. I speak Spanish. The only thing is that in my country, most of the people from my church in my country was from my country. <laughs> now I do understand what it is to plant a multicultural Hispanic church. We all speak Spanish, but we are different. And I needed to understand what he, God, what Jesus did to us to be able to go and do the same. And this is what Jesus is telling us to do. So let me finish today by, by saying this as a, as a personal application. We have an amazing opportunity to do the things that God has called us to do. To do the things that he has done to us, to others. It is called the CNBC family. Personally, every church in as a convention, we have the opportunity to do to others what Jesus has done to us. He has done great things in the past, and those great things is why we are here today. It is about the kingdom gospel movement. And you know, if I can share with you, it has been a blessing to my personal life, to the ministry that, that by the grace of God, I've been calling to. It has been a blessing to be a part, to be, to be seated at the national leaderboard for the past years, to hear from, from leaders for from across Canada, what he's doing, what he has done, the way he's doing it, the right way, it has been a blessing. And now that we know this, we ought to do the same to others. So I want to encourage one of, uh, each one of us today. Now that we may understand what Jesus has been doing, what God has been doing in us, through us, to go and do the same. To not take this time that we are living in for granted. Let's do our best to really understand what Jesus has done to us as the CNBC family that we are, in how we can help others, churches, leaders, pastors, disciples, and go and do the same. Let me pray. Father, I want to thank you for today once again. Thank you for, for another great opportunity you're giving us to, to gather together as the family we are. Church leaders, active members, pastors from across Canada, every region of this country is represented here, looking after you and taking the time to, to look into to hear from you what you have been doing to us. So, Father, please help us continue moving forward according to your will. We know it's, it's all about you. We know it's your way, not ours. So, Father, please help us. Help me to have this in mind and in my heart always and, and to not forget it or to lose focus. We need you, God. 
We need you as much as we have in the past. And we always will. Please, Father, help us take decisions today based on what we read in your word today. And when doing that, please help us, Father, to, to really understand that we also should do as you have done to us. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. In your name I pray. Amen. Yes, thank you, J.D. All right, we're going to get set up for our time of panel discussion. Uh, and what we're going to have is just our entities come up and join us. Uh, so if you guys could come on up. And Jeff, I'm going to let, let you introduce this time. What we've, what we've experienced already is, um, I think, a, a, holy, a holy moment, what we've had. When, um, when we were worshiping, there was a haunting phrase, if all of you means less of me, then take everything. And I don't know about you, I sang that word the first time without really thinking. And every time I sang that phrase, it was harder and harder to sing it. And then as we were led in prayer, um, Lord, we don't want to go if you don't go with us. And then, do you understand what I've done to you? We just heard. The call that God has called and put upon us as CNBC pastors and leaders is not a call that the world understands, and it's not really a call that's natural to our human nature. Um, in human nature is we compete. We, we compete. We have winners and we have losers. That isn't the way of Jesus. The way of Jesus is we collaborate. We trust. We love. We think the best of. We give the benefit of the doubt. We tie in together. And, uh, and when I think about, about the, the, the leaders that you see here, uh, I have just sensed, you know, part of what I sense God was asking me to do is we've al always had a sweet spirit uh, of cooperation between all of our entities. It's always been a spirit of cooperation. Um, but I just sense the Lord saying, we need to take another step forward and have it a spirit of collaboration where we are all working together <laughs> um, interdependently, and, um, which is a biblical picture, I think. And so when I look at this, this group of men here, uh, I, I see people for me like, I can't speak for all of you because I know all of you don't know these leaders like I do. But um, for me, I can trust them. I can give my life to them. Um, I just think of Rob. He and I, we were pastoring in Calgary together, both kind of noobs, didn't know much, <laughs> making lots of mistakes. And, um, and we met every Thursday morning at 6 for prayer. Part, and uh, 
and he <laughs> coached me, and I coached him, and, and, um, and God knit our hearts together in that process that like, we're, there's a deep love relationship that we have with one another. And I, I think of Andrew, and Andrew was part of my, my team. We were planting churches in Toronto. He's my, uh, we, were, we were working through the sanctuary, and there was moments, in fact, I can think of one key moment that my leadership was challenged like I've never experienced anything in my life. And most of the people took a few steps back and said, I'm going to see how this plays out. Andrew took a few steps forward and says, I'm with you. And we were, it was a lonely battle. <laughs> but um, God saw us through. I trust this man with my life. And Odie, Cheryl, um, so they've just recently come to Canada here. But you know how they came? They came like this. What can we do? How can we serve? How can we bless? And Odie checks in on me all the time saying, what can I do? How can I serve? And so where, where we're going with the CNBC is moving from beautiful cooperation to powerful collaboration. And, um, and so our, our, even in our, our team leader meetings and our team leader retreats, these guys are part of the CNBC team leadership. And uh, it's, it's not going and reporting out to the seminary. You know the seminary is involved in the decisions that we're making. It's not like we're going to go report out to the IMB. No, the IMB is involved in the decisions that we're making. It's not like we're going to report to the SEN network. No, the SEN network is involved in the decisions that we're making. And so that we have this one unified mission that God has called us to. And, uh, and I think that next gear that we're shifting into is going to be powerful. One mission. So I'm going to hand this over to Bo. Thank you, Jeff. We wanted to have this panel discussion uh, in light of that. Exactly what Jeff just set the stage for is that when you think, when we think CBT, Canadian Baptist Theological Seminary and College, we think CNBC. When we think SIN Network, we think CNBC. When we think International Mission Board, we think CNBC. So these questions are phrased in that way, and, and actually, we cheated. I asked these guys, what do you want me to ask you? Because just like Jeff said, we know there's, there's a dream in each heart that God has put there. And it's right in alignment with what Jeff said. But there's one entity that, or one person who was, a couple people who weren't able to be with us today, and one of those is Kevin Azell, who is the president of North American Mission Board. But he is, sends his greetings by video, so let's show that video. Hello, Canadian Baptist. I'm Kevin Ezell, president of the North American Mission Board. And I want to say a special hello to my good friend, Jeff Christopherson, and thank all of you for your partnership as we work together to spread the gospel in Canada, throughout North America, and around the world. We continue to see strong new churches planted throughout Canada, and they are reaching new people for Christ. They're serving communities in so many ways, providing much needed encouragement and hope. Most of all, they bring the hope of the gospel where it's so needed. Our Sin Relief missionaries and ministry centers are serving vulnerable populations every day. You and your church can join them by sending mission teams to serve alongside in ministry. Our Toronto Ministry Center is a great place to serve, but we'd love to have your mission teams at any one of our 20 ministry centers throughout North America. The spiritual landscape in Canada is changing as we come together to do this kingdom work. In fact, more than half of all CNBC churches in existence today were started since 2010. That is truly amazing. Most of all, we can all celebrate the people who are coming to Christ through these churches and growing number of baptisms have resulted. But now is not the time to back down. There are many challenges. Sometimes it seems like outside forces are lining up against us, but you are making a difference. 
You're seeing lives being changed. We cannot turn from this calling. We can't let darkness prevail. The North American Mission Board is proud to be your partner, and we are going to walk beside you every step of the way. As you gather this week, I hope you will be refreshed and encouraged. I'm excited about what lies ahead. Together, I know we will see God do incredible things. Thank you again for all that you're doing, and may God bless you. Andrew, I want to start with you. Uh, so grateful for our greeting from Kevin Azell. Andrew, you represent one of two major embassies of the North American Mission Board here right. in Canada. Uh, could you share with us, Kevin shared a little bit, but what is that other entity, and can you give us a little update sure. on their ministry here in Canada? That other entity is Send Relief. And you saw on the map there, it's Toronto, but to be geographically correct, it's slightly west of Toronto. It's in the city of Hamilton. And Kim McGibbon is our leader there. And we've recently hired a woman named Eben, who is a refugee. And she's gone through our, came to Canada as a true refugee and went through the whole political gamut of standing before a judge. And, you know, Brett Porter knows the story of walking with her and his church did. And so Kim and Eben are building and starting to send relief that's going to be refugee focused. And this is going to be a place that the North American Mission Board is going to pour into. We're looking at building something that you as churches can come and be part of there to learn how to engage refugees in a way that you maybe haven't even thought of. Some of you are doing great work already, probably, in this area. But this is it's going to add fuel to what you are doing. And just from firsthand experience of people who've walked that road coming into Canada, simple things like... I just learned something the other day of like, they were saying, we're doing cooking classes with refugees. And they say, well, they go to the food bank and they're given a box of Aunt Jemima pancake mix. And they go, what do I do with this? They're given a potato. And they're going, what do I do with this? Right? So just very simple, practical things. But that's, these are things we can learn together. So I'm really excited what's going to happen because of the Send Relief working with our churches across Canada. So this is not just a Ontario thing. This is a national scope we're looking at. Amen. We're excited yeah. that Sin Relief is getting on board here Absolutely. in Canada. Love it. Well, Andrew, I also want to ask you, uh, as director of Sin Network Canada, um, Andrew, what is your hope for Sin Network and CNBC? I'll answer that question by starting something first. Um, if you are a Send Network employee, if you're a NAM Canada employee, just please stand up for a second. Stand up, guys, all of you. No, no, stay standing, stay standing, stay standing. If you are a endorsed NAM missionary, you're receiving funds, raising funds through NAM. Stand up. Chaplains, you're part of this too. Come on. <laughs> you're not standing. <laughs> I'm telling you, these newfies, come on. You're getting money from NAM. Stand up. Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> Gee, Willikers. <laughs> so, we have been so, so, so blessed by our friends to the south of us. Stupid generosity. You guys can sit down now. <laughs> but what excites me about the future is, is Send Networks, North American Mission Board, Send Relief, Send Network. CNBC, we are CNBC, is the future of working together, what Jeff shared about. And, you know, the, the, we're building upon the foundation that was laid. We talked about, you know, the history of CNBC, the, the, the black Henry and Jack and praying. You know, I poke fun of my East Coaster friends, but they're an answer to prayer five years ago. Become a coast-to-coast -coast convention. 
And there's conversations, possible conversations, up in none of it. We could become a coast to coast to coast convention, which would be really cool. But what excites me about the future is, picking up what Jeff said, you know, we're commanded to love one another. We get that. Nowhere do I read in scripture, we're commanded to like one another. I like these guys. <laughs> Jeff talked about trust. And liking someone and trusting someone and is easy to collaborate together and it's easy to love. And the fact that we do this together, that we are here to serve you, CNBC churches. That's the sole purpose of what Send Relief and Send Network is, is to serve CNBC churches. Start and serve you, the pastors. Start churches and serve you, the pastors, to fulfill what God's laid on your heart. So the future is looking really great. I'm, I'm saying a phrase, it's time we move out of our parents' basement. We've, the U.S. has been incredibly generous to us, but we need to stand on our own two feet. We need to move out of our parents' house. We, we need to be able to look at each other and get to the point if, if something dramatic happened, and they said, okay, we're not giving any more money to resourcing the mission in Canada. We would look around this room and go, we'd go, okay. God still called us to be on mission. We'll figure it out. It's going to look differently. But we're going to continue because we're united, because we like each other, we collaborate together, and we love each other. So that's what excites me about the future. Amen. Thank you, Andrew. And Andrew, why would it be important for our churches to understand that the Sin Network plants CNBC churches? We start CNBC churches. The Sin Network is the primary way we start CNBC churches. Um, my parents are Dutch, and I've been accused of being blunt sometimes. Never. That bluntness has got me into trouble sometimes. Sometimes these blunt statements kind of stick. And one that seems to have taken a bit of traction is isolation kills. You're a pastor. If you're a pastor, you're a pastor's wife. You know it's lonely out there. It can be really lonely. And one of the things that Send Network values and hammers again and again is not letting any pastor and their family stand alone. Because you see it. You, we probably have too many stories in this room of friends that were in ministry. You watch them drift off. And you tried. They didn't respond. Maybe you tried desperately. And they may have literally shunned you. That, that happens. But the fact to know that you're with part of a, a group of brothers and sisters, that when he comes knocking on your door, they come knocking on your door, they genuinely you know they want your best interest. That's why. That's what we're, we do this together. We're on mission together. We're not doing it on our own. So that's what, that's why we do this. Amen. We are not alone. God is with us and he's given us us, yep. right? He is with us all the time and he's given us a family. Thank you, Andrew. Yep. Thank you. Odie, I'd like to ask you just a question or two from the perspective of the International Mission Board here in Canada. So, Odie, uh, share some examples of how IMB works in partnership with Canadian Baptist Theological Seminary, SIN Network, to advance God's kingdom through the CNBC. First, uh, I'll start with saying when I first entered Canada, I looked at my invitation letter and it said, ah, CNBC. So, I'm like, okay, I'm here, I'm part of CNBC, so my, my heart is to lead our IMB uh, family to be partner to be together to be CNBC and to not see ourselves as IMB but to see ourselves as as Canadian National Baptist Convention people. So uh, I have a few of our IMB uh, personnel here. Uh, Van Over stand up and Kyle and Sarah come in here and Glenn you're here somewhere. Cheryl you got to stand up too. Come in the back room. All right here you go. So um, <laughs> you guys. okay. All right, some, some ways we are working together and, and being a part of CNBC is uh, four of our professors at, the, at our seminary are IMB 
uh, IMB missionaries. Uh, we help with uh, engagement training, like digital engagement training, with some of our uh, churches and, and our CNBC churches in, in uh, Ontario, and uh, with strategies for engagement and uh, gospel proclamation, equipping and training. Uh, several of our IMB personnel are, are serving together with CNBC to, uh, to reach engage collegiate populations, college, university students, to share the gospel, disciple, and bring about healthy church formation. So not just IMB, but together with, uh, with our CNBC family in that. And then in, in the four provinces where we do have IMB personnel, uh, we work as part of our, our city teams, our, our SIN uh, church planning process to help find church planners, uh, catalyze and mobilize, uh, assess and equip and ongoing uh, mentoring coaching with those church planners. So there's just a few of the ways, and it's, uh, it's I just want to say it, it's, it's great, great to be in Canada. Whenever I travel internationally, it's really nice when people ask me, where are you from? I get to say I'm from Canada. I don't have to say I'm from the USA. It's just, I get, I like, I have a, I get a lot different response. If I say I'm from the U.S., they're like, you know, they want to argue with me about something. If I say, <laughs> I say I'm, from, I'm from Canada, they're like, Okay, well, you're a nice person, you know. And, <laughs> so, <laughs> so. Odie, thank you. You know, I love that there's that there's real collaboration happening within the entities already, and that that's how God brought you into this into this nation was to say, how can we be part of what God is doing here as CNBC? That's awesome. I love it. Odie, what are some unique ways that the IMB, the International Mission Board, work in Canada contributes to our collaborative effort to getting the gospel to the people from the nations of the world who make Canada their home? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I think first about a, a mission mindset. So in Canada, we, we have to think missionally. The world is here. We have to think about engaging the people from the world who are here. And so as IMB missionaries, we, we have that experience, that expertise, that training to think about cultures and language, religious backgrounds and how to engage those people with gospel proclamation. So uh, practically that works out. For example, one of our uh, IMB personnel from uh, previous experience in North Africa are working with one of our CNBC churches to help them think about engaging a people from a North African nation who have settle in large numbers around that church community, CNBC Church, help them think about how to engage that people with the gospel appropriately and training and equipping that church. So that's a, a practical way in terms of, of uh, engagement and mission engagement. Another uh, thought that comes to my mind is, is just global connectivity. The, as, as the world is coming to Canada, is in Canada, and will continue to come to Canada, the, the, our, as Canadians, we're going to be going globally. And so in that, there's a global co connectivity. For example, um, with our, our Cuban uh, mission partnership. There, with that, there's a, that long time ago, uh, many years ago when I first started, there was a, an introduction in that with our, our IMB global connectivity. And recently, a graduate of our, of our seminary, originally I think from South Korea, but wanted to think about where he could serve internationally. So we were able to connect him uh, with a, an IMB team in Vietnam. And he's working, I think he's moved there now, working there with that IMB team in, in Vietnam. So global connectivity. Uh, one of our churches is wanting to raise up a team within their church to, to be somewhere internationally. So we were able to connect them with an IMB team in Cambodia. And that church is praying monthly and raising up a team from that church, not just for short term, mission engagement for a long term to have uh, Canadians from that church who will move to uh, Cambodia a uh, long term to, to work with that IMB team. So another uh, the third thing is just with, with language cultural resources. Um, a, uh, uh, Paul introduced us to a, a couple in Ontario who are working with Alpha with, uh, with, with Chinese from mainland China and they are like but well, what's the next step? So then we're able to help come along with this couple, help them think about 
uh, cultural, appropriate language, appropriate uh, processes to help w w with evangelism, the next step beyond Alpha with these Mandarin uh, uh, these people from China, mainland China, who, who need it in Mandarin. Odie, oh, that's amazing. Just helping us engage the people that God is bringing from the world, uh, partnering with our churches to say we are connected globally, and we need to be connected globally, and then just, man, equipping in the area of languages so we can reach the nations that God is bringing here. We love it. It's fun. We love it. It is fun, right? It is fun. fun. Awesome. Just amazing. Dr. Blackaby. Dr. Blackaby, <laughs> Rob, Rob, let me ask you a couple questions. How is the Canadian Baptist Theological Seminary and College, how is it an expression of the dreams and the work of the CNBC as well as International Mission Board and Send Network? That's a great question, Bo. I know I fed it to you, but... Um... <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant, brilliant. Um, <laughs> it, it's really important to me. <clears throat> you know, seminaries uh, do not exist for themselves. <clears throat> it's tempting, hmm. it's tempting for any entity to begin to believe that it exists for its own ends and its own purposes. But when this convention was founded, uh, the, the very first thing they did as a newly established denomination was to say right in the middle of our future needs to be a theological education center. Like th that is our reason for existence is to train Canadian leaders on Canadian soil for Canadian ministry. And um, so when I hear the, the dream and the passion of Jeff's heart last night, that directly influences what we're doing in the classroom because that's what we know our students are going to be graduating and going out into. Matter of fact, let me rephrase that because a lot of our students are joining us from the field and they're already in it right now. Like we have a church planning class being taught by one of our former faculty members, Ian Bunton, right now. And what is it, a little over a dozen and a half students. They're already practitioners, they're already planting. And so um, it, it just really gives this pointed. Uh, when we say training leaders for tough places or training God called men and women for 21st century leadership in tough places, it's not just a slogan that, that drips off our tongue. It's that we know that being ministers of, for Christ in Canada is going to cost us much. And, um, and we want to see students graduate and not just survive, but thrive in ministry in the CNBC. Now, now what God's done in order to let that happen is that he touched the hearts of the International Mission Board and said from our very founding, we're gonna make sure you have missionaries who are professors. So early on when I got to the seminary, what, over 16 years ago, you think, well, we, without the International Mission Board, I don't know how we, we can't afford a faculty. Well, by God's grace, like, you just need to know it's, it's on a site, but God is growing and then uh, uh, rapidly a faculty endowment to where we can hire our own faculty. We get to hire a Scott McDonald, for example. So then you think, well, okay, when God has done that, the work of the IMB is done. And I would say no, because what, what the importance of the International Mission Board is to keep infusing that missionary DNA into who we are and what we do. We talk about missional, they're missionary, missionary DNA, so that everybody, no matter where you go in Canada, we're thinking missionary, um, exegeting culture. It's not about climbing a corporate ladder, it's about giving yourself away. And everybody, it, I mean, our students just get immersed in that in every class because they're missionaries teaching them. And then when I think about SEND Network, you know, on an average year, somewhere around 40% of our students will graduate to, into, into some church planting. Um, it's meaningful to me to know that during the course of their study, they're being introduced to the SEND network. They graduate and they immediately have support as they transition into the planting of a church and, and, and knowing how to do that as a team and have that, that support network, not just in the first year, but really through the early years. And I will add this, it's been really meaningful that the CNBC has said to those who are going to pastor existing churches, yeah, we got Garth Lino, who's gonna make sure that you're not you're not uh, out there and feel unseen. You're going to be connected. So 
I could go on and on, obviously, but that, I mean, it's just some really neat ways that I think our school um, is integrated with all three of these. I love it. Are you guys getting an idea of collaboration? Me too. Me too. Does the CNBC vision resonate with the purpose of Canadian Baptist Theological Seminary and College to train leaders for tough places? And if it does, how so? Well, not, not really. That's, is that another good question? <laughs> yeah, don't, don't isolate that as a sound clip. Um, <laughs> that was a dangerous thing to do. Thoroughly, it thoroughly resonates with who we are and what we believe God's called us to be about. Matter of fact, if, if, it, if, if it's not for that kind of a vision, like I say, we exist because of the CNBC. That kind of vision gives us juice to do what we're doing. And we do believe that it, it actually underscores the vision for training leaders for tough places. Coming out of COVID, we realized places are tougher still. Coming out of COVID, we realized that not just our Canadian culture, but also church culture can be pretty tough, like tougher still. But one, here's what gives me hope. Uh, from all across Canada, and now during COVID with this on, online reach, so that we can have classrooms with people who are live in the classroom, people who are live on the screen, people who are actually joining us, yeah. you know, outside in classic kind of online format, we now reach across Canada into all of our time zones. And so we're watching God raise leaders up from our churches. I'm blown away at who God is bringing to our school to study. To study. And, then, and then in addition to the Canadians, he's adding others from other places yeah. in North America. And in addition to that, we have students from Mexico, yeah. Netherlands, Korea, Hong Kong, uh, Ghana, Nigeria, Zambia. I could go, like, so here, so just in case you look at our, our world and you think, oh man, God, there's just so much, so little hope. I'm reminded every day when I look at our student body, there is an infinite hope. God is raising up a mission force for Canada in Canada, but also bringing them from other shores to our shores to reach those who are coming to our land as immigrants or as, uh, and anyway, I, I just think it resonates so well with what God's called us to be about in the heart of the CNBC. Aren't you thankful? I'm thankful. Guys, we are so grateful for you. We're grateful. Thank you for participating in this panel discussion today. We're grateful for each of you. Would you join me in prayer as we pray for our entities? God, we thank you for Odie. God, we thank you for Andrew. We thank you for Rob. God, we thank you for the International Mission Board, for the SIN Network, and we thank you for the Canadian Baptist Theological Seminary and College. God, thank you that we are not islands unto ourselves, God. We are not isolated, but God, you have brought us together to work together towards your kingdom mission to share, reveal the gospel message of Jesus and God, to participate in your mandate to make disciples. So Lord, we pray for these men and we pray for the entities that they represent here today that stretches across Canada, across the world. Father, would you lead them? Lord, we know you will. We pray that they would keep their eyes fixed on you. God, we pray for them and all of those who work with them in these entities, God, that you would protect them. God, that they would guard their heart above all else. And God, that when you say, step here, Lord, that you're going to give them the courage to take the next step of faith and the next step of faith and the next step of faith. Heavenly Father, we praise you. We thank you. Lord, would you bless them. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, guys. Thank you. We are now going to move into the business portion of our time, the time you've all been waiting for. I just want to give a couple of instructions before we begin. Uh, one, if you're a messenger and you have your messenger card, 
Um, we are so glad you have that messenger card. One thing we discovered is that the QR code in that messenger card is not working. So we have new cards for you. So if you have a messenger card, would you please hold that in the air? And we have Hannah, and we have, let's see, Vaughn and Linda, and they will get you a new card. Paul's going to be here. He's going to take minutes for us today. All right, one other request we have. If you have the ability to use your phone data instead of Wi-Fi, could you do that? Because we're having a little bit of trouble with the overloading the uh, router. Oh, let's, not, let's not motion to adjourn. Michael, can you click to that first? It's just because of where the mouse is, okay? So we're going to go ahead and thank you for that, though. Much appreciated. So before I get into, yeah, we're going to give, we're going to go through this. Um, so what's going to happen is it's going to show up on your phone, and if you need help with anything, just raise your hand, and we have some of our regional ministry leaders who are here to help you if you're struggling to get the QR code to work or anything else. They're here to help, okay? So just raise your hand if you need, a, if you need a, a hand here. We are going to, these are going to be done electronically. So when you get to those pages and we get to voting, we just want to make sure that you know you can vote whatever, whatever you want to vote. You hit the vote and then please hit submit because if you don't hit submit, then it won't count. And then you're going to see all the results go immediately up onto the screen, Okay. All the results are going to go immediately up on the screen. So you have a new QR code. If you have a data plan that you can use, please use that. And then when you vote, you're just going to hit whatever yay or nay that you choose and then hit submit, okay? Don't forget that submit part. It's just like walking with Jesus. Don't forget the submit part, right? Okay, good. All right, and we're going to go along. In the first couple of things, there won't be a vote. You can, hit, you can give a thumbs up to calling the meeting to order if you want. You can give a thumbs up to the seating of messengers, okay, if you want. But then when we get to voting, you'll see those votes come up, all right? Okay, so I want to explain a little bit of why J.D. Fossilino is the president of the convention and the other guy is not. One, he's better at the job, okay? Uh, but... I, was, I had the humbling privilege of serving as the president of CNBC uh, for the last couple of years, and then I had the opportunity to come on staff with the Canadian Convention, uh, Canadian National Baptist Convention, and so I'm just honored to serve. So thankful to be part of this team. So thankful to be part of this convention. And so um, when that opportunity came up, I offered my resignation as the president and then Jeff made a really great phone call. He said, J.D., got some great news, and I got some bad news. I didn't ask which was the bad news. But he said, Bo is taking a position on the CNBC. So that means, J.D., you're up, brother. El Presidente. And that meant that Victor Summers became the first vice president. You know... 
one of the great things about walking with God is that we say, God, we want to be prepared, but you're the one who leads, so we want to be flexible. And so JD stepped in with a lot of other things on his plate, but he said, I'm ready. So I'm so grateful for you, JD. Thank you. Amen. So, JD, you come and you call us to order. Now I understand why I'm the president. Thank you. <laughs> so this is the fun part, as you heard. So let me call to order uh, this meeting. And again, if you have a question about the voting, uh, messengers, get ready uh, for everything that we're going to do for the next uh, three, four hours. It's not going to be that long. Um, <laughs> why are you laughing at? <laughs> uh, so let, yeah, let's call to order. Uh, uh, Paul Johnson is taking the notes, uh, and let's also, uh, uh, I heard that thumbs up, but we don't need that to call to order, but uh, if you want to do that, do that, but, uh, and, and let's call for the seating of messengers. Uh, I, I do want to see the, the messengers because uh, Bo was, but uh, can you raise your hand if you're a messenger? Okay. Okay. I'm going to call the seating of messengers uh, as well. We don't need to vote on those two call to order and seating of messengers. You're going you're gonna to see me watching this side of the, <laughs> just to confirm some things here. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, Wayne Campbell, Wayne Campbell to stand, and uh, Wayne Campbell served in the Credentials Committee, and he's recommending um, churches to be seated at the CNBC. I was just asked to ask any churches that we are saying your name to please stand. Um, but uh, the Credentials Committee is recommending four churches to be seated this year. Uh, Mill, uh, the Mill Christian Fellowship. Are you guys here? Okay. Um, yeah. There you go. Billberry Creek Baptist Church. Not here. Okay. Uh, Port City Church. Okay. And then Trails Church. In the back. So those are the four we would like to see this year. Thank you, Wayne. Um, so if uh, we have discussion on this, uh, I forgot to mention that we have the two mics uh, here. Uh, if you have something you want to share about it, if you know the churches, or if you don't, we can go and vote. Uh, but I want to open every time uh, there's a something on the table, I want to ask for discussion. If there's not discussion, we will go and vote. Um, someone needed to say or to ask or anything? Okay, let's vote. Uh, so go and vote. Again, you need to submit your vote and please do that. Looks like we have majority. I don't see anything different than in favor, so welcome. Well, let's wait, because we have one more. Okay. Okay, so it's a proof. We have these four new churches coming into the family. Welcome to the CNBC family. Yeah. <laughs> Next item is uh, Chad. You just got into the family, so stay calm. <laughs> okay, that, that you can ask. <clears throat> uh, so CNBC president appoints the following names to serve on the credentials committee. I don't know if we have the definition up there, but uh, the committee uh, will be responsible for, uh, responsible for evaluating the Constitution, bylaws, 
of new churches for CNBC constitutional compliance for new voting member congregations. This committee will also determine whether the new church statement of faith is in conflict with the CNBC statement of faith for new voting member churches. So uh, I'm proposing a Jack Avakian. Can you stand up, Jack? Jack Avakian is here. He's serving. He's, he has a servant heart, so he's here. I know you're here. I know you're here. He, uh, Wayne Campbell. You just saw Wayne Campbell. And Rob uh, Buntine. Rob is here? No. Oh, right. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to open the, the floor for discussion. If you need to ask or you need to say something, this is the moment for you. Okay, let's vote. Let's proceed to vote. Uh, go again to your device, hit submit. Oh, I so appreciate that you are. It looks like we are all in favor. Thank you, Bo. Okay, all in favor, uh, approve. <laughs> I'm just gonna say that, Bo, just to clarify that. Bo, Bo is reminding me that because he's a president's appoint, we don't need discussion on that. But we need to vote. The president appoints, but the president don't make the decision. Is the floor. But we don't need discussion on that. So the next one, uh, president appoints the following names to serve on the nominating committee. Uh, uh, the definition is that uh, the committee will be responsible for nominating members to the National Leader Board, the CNBC Foundation, and the trustee of the Canadian Baptist Theological Seminary and College. So we have two names. We have Jeremiah Smith. Is he here? Yes. Urban Grace Church, he, he's a local, you can say that. <laughs> Jean-Marc Princeville, I'm sorry about that, I should ask before, Jean-Marc is here. Jean-Marc is from Eglise du Mont Bellevue, ask Jacques about that, I don't know how to pronounce it. <laughs> but we're gonna vote, Jeremiah and Jean-Marc, let's vote for the Nominating committee. Okay. Have one opposed, fortified favor. It is approved. You can clap. You can clap. Welcome, Jeremiah. Welcome, John Mark. Um, another point of discussion that we have here, do we need to explain this, Jeff, the sex abuse tax task force? You want to take? Yes, please. Um, some of you are aware uh, that our, our um, sister um, re relationship with the SBC down south has had some issues uh, in this in this area, and and so we felt, even though we've not had any issue or accusation, um, we still wanted to get ahead of this and build a build a way or a process that when uh, when things like this come to fore, pray it never happens. Um, we have a process in which what we're doing. So um, we've asked Lou Leventhal. Uh, to chair that, and we'll build a committee around that to make a presentation of uh, what our our uh, sexual abuse uh, policy will be. And uh, so that's that. Thank you, Jeff. As he said, we want to be ahead. And, and that's why we're appointing Lou Leventhal as chairman of the Sex Abuse Task Force. So we're going to vote on that. If you can go and proceed to vote.
task force that the members are recommended by Lou and myself. Yeah. Yeah. It's an, an ad hoc kind of thing. Yeah, we're just uh, starting the process, having him as the chairman. So, yeah, it's going to be a process to do that, and then we're going to move. Thank you. Okay, you are all in favor, and it is approved. Thanks, God, for that. Uh, item number seven. Uh, the following names are nominated for the CNBC National Leader Board and CNBC Foundation Board. So we have J.D. Fasolino, term four, Victor Somers, term four, Janet Campbell, term three, Dick Hale, term two, Stephen Bray, term two, Brad Williams, term two, Steve Fish, for the first term in and Gener Baptiste. I'm s Can you say that again? Angener Baptiste. Thank you. I should have asked before. So these are the names we have, and for this, we can have discussion. If you have any questions um, you, that you want to ask, Steve and. They are here. Okay, can you stand up so we can, we can actually recognize you? Okay. Let me see. Okay. Thank you, engineer. Thank you for being willing to be a part of the, of the board. Do we have discussion? Do we have questions? Okay. Let's proceed and vote. I don't know if I should say the, but, but we have more actually now <laughs> voting. <laughs> it is approved. So welcome to the, the new members to the National Labor Board. And thank you all that have been serving for the past years. Uh, for item number eight, I'm going to ask Joanne to come here. She can do it from here because I'm going to sit down on this one. So we are now nominating the directors of the CNBC National Leadership Board. Uh, first starting with the position of president, J.D. Fasolino is the incumbent acting president right now. Do we have any other nominations from the floor? No other nominations? Okay, well, I believe we are required to vote on it. So if we want to vote on J.D. Fasolino as president, vote now. I don't know what the numbers are, but I don't see any yellow lines, so I am going to say that it is approved. Thank you, J.D. <laughs> Okay, next position is first vice president. We have Victor Summers, who is the incumbent. Do we have any other nominations from the floor for first vice president? Pretty quiet. Okay, let us vote for Victor Summers as first vice president. It has passed. <laughs> and for the position of second vice president, we currently do not have anyone in that position because the Victor and JD moved forward. So do we have any nominations for second vice president? My name is Casey Van Balasingham. 
representing Fellowship Pickering from Ontario, and I want to nominate Brad Williams, second vice president. Do you know where Brad is from? Do you have a little bit of in? He's from Winnipeg. He's from Winnipeg. Yes. Is Brad here today? He's not here. No. Has he been contacted? If it, has he? Ex will he accept that nomination? Yes. Yes, he will. Okay. Yes, he will. Is there any other nominations from the floor for second vice president? No, these are big jobs and these are great people that are filling the shoes. So we will have a nomination for Brad Williams from Winnipeg, Manitoba as second vice president. Let us vote on that now. We vote again. Okay, vote on it now, please. And I would say it has passed. Oh, do we need to second that motion? Okay, sorry, I, for the nomination of Brad Williams, I should have had that seconded. Could I have somebody second that nomination? No, I've worked alongside these three people for the last few years, and they are amazing men, have servant hearts, and we are in God's. God has given us some capable leaders to help us move forward. Thank you. And Joanne actually served on our board for the last four years as well out of Saskatchewan and has done an incredible job. Thank you for leading us, Joanne. Thank you. I am Victor Summers. We may not have met, but you know guys like me. I'm the lad that finds himself in positions where he does not belong, <laughs> surrounded by people, does not belong. I often look around with the staff and the board of CNBC, and I hope they don't find out that I don't belong. I'm so blessed to be here. I'm so blessed to be a part of CNBC. And uh, you know, I'm from New Brunswick. And uh, I know you all think we're the arm part, ar armpit of Canada, all right? Newfoundland makes us look good. And uh, <laughs> from Miramichi City, very, you, you all go, ah, uh, but you, many of you don't even know there's any Canada past Toronto, okay? <laughs> I'm from Miramichi City, which is probably the most insignificant uh, town in, in New Brunswick. We kind of relish in that, don't we, Steve, a little bit? Yeah? No, it's good. It's so good to be here. Thank you, Shane, for hosting us and his team as well. Uh, the following names are being nominated for trustee of Canadian Ma uh, Baptist Theological Seminary and College. Uh, we're going to uh, put those up on the screen, and I'm going to attempt um, to pronounce all these names. Jessica Holmes, Chuck Morton, Tim Yancey, James Cho, Laura Christofferson. Nailed that one. Mike Blackaby, Mark Palmer, Keith Malden, Kesavan Balasingham. <laughs> I have a story for you after Kesavan. Okay. Uh, and Conrad Au. Uh, and the terms are listed there as well. Um, so we have nominated them as National Leadership Board. We're just looking for a vote from the members. Okay? So you can go ahead and vote now. Uh, sorry, there should be some discussion on this. Is there any discussion from the floor? No discussion? Go ahead and vote, please. All votes are in. We're looking for an, a unanimous uh, 50, 51% vote, and we have it, so the motion passes. Thank you.
Item number 10. The board recommends the appointment of the accounting firm Dart Bryant from Calgary, Alberta as auditors for the National, uh, Canadian National Baptist Convention, the Canadian Baptist Theological Seminary and College, and the CNBC Foundation for 2023. Uh, so again, this uh, was recommended by the leadership board at our uh, spring meeting on April 18th and 19th, 2023. Any discussion on our auditors? No discussion. We're calling for a vote from the members to approve the appointment of this accounting firm, Dart Bryant. And that's a unanimous vote. Thank you. The board, National Leadership Board, is recommending the adoption of the 2024 Canadian National Baptist Convention operating budget. And you should know at the uh, April meeting, uh, we were presented with the budget from the CNBC staff uh, and the National Leadership Board spent quite a bit of time going over that uh, budget line by line and uh, lots of questions of course come up at that time and the, and the budget for 2024 was presented to the board. Uh, it was uh, voted on by the board and approved and now we're looking for a, an, an approval from our members and so that is what we're voting on now. You've hopefully had an opportunity to review the budget for 2024. And I want to open the floor to discussions on said budget. Very good. Could you go ahead and vote, please? Approving the budget for 2024. And that vote passes. Appreciate the one opposed. It's nice to see some extra color. <laughs> Item 12, recommend the adoption of the 2024 CNBC Foundation operating budget. And again, this budget was presented to us at the National Leadership Board meetings on April 18th and 19th and was reviewed. Questions were asked of the staff at that time. You've had an opportunity to review that budget and we're looking for a vote from the members. Any discussion from the floor on the adoption of the 2024 CNBC Foundation operating budget? No questions or discussion, go ahead and vote. Don't forget to press submit. Very good, motion passes. Recommend the adoption of the 2023-2024 Canadian Baptist Theological Seminary and College budget. Uh, this budget was presented to the National Leadership Board uh, just shortly after our national uh, meeting. We had an opportunity to review and to ask questions. It was approved at that time by the National Leadership Board in a uh, majority vote. And we're asking for an approval uh, from our members now, so any discussion or questions from the floor on the 2023-2024 Canadian Baptist, Baptist Theological Seminary and College budget, please. And that motion passes. Great, I'm going to call on uh, Jeff Christofferson now uh, to come up with some explanation on the next motion. So this is, this is we're going to be talking about is uh, a three-year cycle for how we might do annual meetings in the future. I spoke about that last night. I kind of sort of launched that out there a little bit. Um, I, I'm thinking a little bit about... Uh, our, the message we heard from our, our president of um, if, if this is going to be difficult, this idea is going to be difficult for anybody in Canada, it's going to be difficult for the people, most difficult for the people in this room. 
because um, for, for what we're saying is it'll be a two, si two years, so we're um, going to do seven regional simultaneous conventions across Canada. We're, we're scheduling the date to coincide with where most of our regional um, annual meetings are in the fall. So we're saying the third week of October, so on a Saturday, so that we can get our, um, our uh, bivocational and co-vocational leaders to be a part of it, as well as lay people that to be a part of it, so we can have as, as big of a, a sort of a turnout as we can have across the regions. And so what that means is that for the, the people, and it's not that, that are faithfully traveling across Canada to come to our annual meeting, that means you're not going to, in those two years, experience that sort of camaraderie that we get to have. But in your giving up that, it's going to give an opportunity for so many more people to experience what God is doing across this country. Um, the way we're even working on this vote idea is a, um, is a bit of a trial to see how, how, can we, how can we do this across Canada. So this is a bit of an experiment. And so I'm watching people vote behind me while I'm explaining this. <laughs> I already decided, no! And um, so two years, um, seven regions, uh, working very closely with all of our regional ministry leaders uh, to do that, and then sort of a collaboration of our regions and our national working together so that we have a, se a greater sense of collaboration. And so uh, I don't know if I need any more explanation than that. But just if you have questions, it might be a better thing. Yes? Is there uh, someone or people involved in some sort of planning regarding the technology to facilitate these meetings? Will something be developed? Are you, as you mentioned, you're testing the voting mechanism, but in terms of the broadcast, is there a level of intentionality there, or is that not started yet because, well, we need a vote first? <laughs> Yes, exactly. We realize, I mean, we want this first one to go really, really well. So people go, that was a good idea, Jeff. I'm really glad you did that. And um, so we will put a lot of energy in it. And, uh, but not yet. We haven't. But it's, it's obviously going to be very, very significant for that. Yeah. Dennis Millen from Dovercourt Baptist Church in Edmonton. I, my only question is, I'm trying to decide how to vote. And my concern is taking away from the associational work. So if we're, if, if we're going to lose any kind of, like when we, because moving to regional was great, but there was a little bit of a loss uh, in some ways for some of the established churches for the associational work for churches from the 60s, like my church. My concern is that we're gonna we're gonna step onto that and lose and there and that meeting will just sort of disappear. And that mechanism, what's going on in the province, we're gonna lose. So how are we gonna protect that? I would I would think our energies are like I know Jerry's intention and it's certainly my intention is to put more energies in I don't want to say the word associational because we're using actually the word regional, but the word regional. Um, uh, and so because a little bit of what I was speaking about earlier, the more, the more we actually dedicate resources in terms of money, um, manpower in our, in our regions, I think the more that we're going to actually have stronger and stronger regions. And so this meeting itself will actually be actually a living testimony of that. So in there there'll be a, a sense of uniformity across all of our seven regions when we're talking about the national things but then when you're talking about the regional things then it would be very specific so that day would be divided into into two sections and uh, that would accom accommodate for both does that answer at all I see uh, for me I, I think as an as a as a church or as a pastor of a church that's 50 years old we get, we repeat, I think at times, or for me as a pastor of that church, I feel very, when we talk about collaboration, I feel like we were lost in the collaboration. When we, on, on the panel, we had 
um, SEN network, and I've been a church planter too, right? So, mm -hmm. and we had the seminary, which is important, which I'm a graduate of, and IMB, and I've worked with the IMB and, and going to Brazil and stuff, and so those are important, but I think we're, I feel like as an older church, I feel like we have become invisible to our denomination. And so that's my, so my concern is, are we going to become even more invisible? Because we're, you know, we were not, I think there's a challenge of engagement. And I, and so my, that's what's going through my mind a bit. So I'm just trying to be honest. Because yeah. I, because I, I haven't voted. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, but, so I, so I'm still, I'm, I'm it sort looks of. looks like your vote, no. No, no, I'm sort of, I'm sort of sitting on the, on, I'm sitting on the fence here. Yeah. Um, because I think right now, as, a ch as our church, we even had to look at our, I mean, I'm, I'm a supporter of the cooperative program. Our church has continued and continues this year in our budget, too. But there was a challenge in my mind, do we give less to the cooperative program and give more to local mission work? And, and so th this is sort of going all, I think this sort of brings into my mind a little bit all those questions. Yeah. And, and how are we going to, like, how are, like, I, I appreciate that we have some of the regional mission mission work or, or, or ministry work going on. I'm not seeing, I'm not necessarily seeing the advantage of it yet. I'm hoping that if we're what we're what we're talking about when we talk about collaboration, we're going to really engage that some, somehow. So that's sort of what why I'm maybe right. the, um, this is a little concerning to me a little bit. Like what I when I, when I think of like for instance, if I ask how many people. Essentially, this, this is Jeff's view, essentially we have a, a regional convention that moves around. And so when it's in Toronto, it's just mostly Toronto pastors and a scattering, a smattering of other people. When it's in Calgary here, we've got mostly Calgary pastors. There's hardly, there's not a, a big representation from the rest of Canada. Sorry? And yeah. And so, so what my what our goal is is actually how do we how do we get a larger sort of buying into this? Because I remember when I think of it, this is going to be just Jeff unfiltered here. Um, in the in the old days, when the convention was small and western, when it was just us, you know, and it was less than a hundred churches, and we kind of grew up together, and and it was like this family, and it was this thing, and. And it was like, I mean, we took our kids and our kids, it was our summer vacation. And, uh, and our kids met with other kids and they grew up with these guys, you know, and it was like a real kind of thing. But that has changed over the years as we have moved eastern and eastern and eastern and eastern, as we've got, gotten larger and more, and now we're at 400 churches. And we will be more. <laughs> in, in, and, uh, and so somehow we have to scale this or it's just going to continue to be a regional convention that moves <laughs> every year somewhere else and and so the people in a particular region only get to experience it you know very rarely and uh, and so I, I don't have an answer how to fix this because right now it honestly feels like I use this it feels like the Sunday evening service that you got to beg people to come to and um, and I want this to be something that is absolutely people are excited to be a, a part of and it's accessible to everybody and so I don't know how to do that by having it just in one spot in Canada and then a smattering of people coming. And so, yeah, that's, the, that's our primary motivation for that. Uh, Dennis here mentioned something that I've been noticing. And um, uh, I don't think it's a bad idea, but... Uh, it's a wonderful idea. Yeah, wonderful, <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. But uh, uh, the older churches have sort of become invisible. It, it, I've really noticed it. And, uh, and also uh, the emphasis, well, I think 100 years ago, in a meeting like this, there'd be a big panel of pastors, for example. And like, how many senior pastors are here? Sixteen, and uh, so you know, uh, we need to connect with our churches and our, our our pastors who are leaders, as well as all the other organizations and and church planters too. And we kind of sliding away from that 
and sort of it'll slide that back in there somehow. Uh, not that this is not a bad idea or would prevent that, but I think that's a, a, an important value. Okay. Bird, thank you. Any other comments on the motion that's being presented by the National Leadership Board? Unfortunately, people have started voting, so could there be an opportunity to add an amendment to it that this is the proposal to be reviewed after next year's gathering, that if it doesn't work next year, we don't have to do another year of it. If it works well, uh, we could continue on with this motion as prepared and proposed, but then it would just be a one year that we're really committing to right now based on a review to ensure that it is functioning or could be amended as required after that. I'm not the parliamentarian here. This is a motion coming from the National Leadership Board. And so to amend that motion, I think, is going to require a second and then a, a vote on the amendment before we. Actually, I think that that's the easiest way. Okay. Okay. Apparently not. Apparently there's a disagreement. Yeah. 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 On the amendment. Okay. Well, <laughs> this, this I'm not the parliamentarian, here's the president, <laughs> but um, I think that motion needs to be have a second, and then there has to be uh, uh, an affirmative vote on the amendment, and then we can change it. And, um, but I, I haven't seen a second yet. Is that possible? I yeah. see a thumbs up from the control booth. Amazing, really, yeah. yeah. So it's being reset. Yes, please. Yes. And we're learning on this technology, so I think in, in the future we might figure out that we don't allow voting until, yeah. Yeah. Question. Excuse me, Jeff. Uh, and Vic, just to, if I could, just procedurally, it's, you know, I think it's kind of awkward to have a vote in process uh, while we're actually debating something. So I would recommend that uh, we not actually vote until people have had opportunity to speak to something, if we could do that. Thank Certainly, you. yes. Yeah. That might have been just a slip of the thumb or uh, just a bit eager with the technology. We understand that, Jeff. Yeah. Just hold your voting yes. until. Yes. Okay. Is it? So I, I'm, I'm a chaplain in Canadian Armed Forces. I, I, I was uh, worked at a church for a while, but I'm not working currently. Working at a church. Can you speak into the mic? Oh, so get a little higher. The um, my question is so so we are doing this now to help churches be able to come to convention meetings more often by saving money instead of spending money every year. Is that the idea behind this, or? I couldn't make you out. So. The, uh, my, my question is, is this idea behind this to allow churches to uh, have to travel across the country or out of, you know, out of province, out of area, more ability to save more money so they can come to these things more regularly, to do it every three years? That's, that's part of the reason. Okay, so yeah. are we doing, but we're voting here in this group only, or are we voting, voting to all the church? Are they all going to get a chance to vote into this, or no? No. No, so, so, so in, in one sense it's kind of, I don't want to say bias, but you know, we're doing it in Calgary in the West, and, I, and, I, and I'm from the West, but I'm in the East right now, so churches I go to now, they're not voting on this, and, and they have no say on this, so is there a way to make it so that it, maybe all churches could get together and vote on this? <laughs> Being that this is the idea for, for all churches to get together with? <laughs> I mean, just for me, I, I think that, um, yeah, this is how we do, how we, the, yeah. yeah. Hey, Jeff. 
I will second the motion to reevaluate after next year. So can Wayne, we Wayne can Campbell from Potter's House? Can we have a statement? Because we don't have that in our minutes anywhere. So could could you repeat it in a way that Paul could get it? I make the motion that we amend the motion on the floor that there be an evaluation completed after October 2024 on the success, the buy-in, and to continue on at that in with this plan. I don't know how that's clear enough. Yeah, yes, to, have some to be kind evaluated of by yeah. the National Leadership Board. Yes. Yes. Uh, Steve Fish from Saskatoon, uh, Faith Baptist Church. And so to the amendment, um, I would be opposed to the amendment because the one year is not enough time to evaluate and we need to go through the full three year cycle to understand whether or not this is going to be uh, fully the way that we want to run from here on. So I would be opposed to this amendment to, to do that. Kelly Reed, Tapestry Church, Cochrane, Alberta. Uh, ditto to what he said. Ditto. <laughs> uh, I'd like to make a motion that we evaluate at the end of three years. So in Newfoundland. We have to deal with this motion first. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Are you withdrawing the motion? So we're back to the original motion. Does a second withdraw? Yep, we're back to the original motion. And let me just say this, we're, our, our goal as National Leadership Board is to have successful events. And uh, so what we want to see is next year we want to see a successful event. And the next year we want to see a successful event. It is, if it's not successful, it's not giving us what we want, uh, obviously we change it. Um, let me, and that's not a promise from me. Uh, I don't have the power to do that, but that's what we're after. Yes. I would like to make an amendment to the original motion to reevaluate this three year cycle after three years by a vote at the, that convention. We have a first and a second for an amendment to the motion. Did you get that, Paul? Any discussion on the amendment? Uh, just a question, please, uh, Gordon Grief. So we're not just voting on the amendment, we're really including the whole idea. Is that correct in this motion? I think, I think we vote on this amendment first and then we vote on the whole thing okay. second. Yep. Thank you. All right, let me just read the amendment uh, and that after the three-year cycle be evaluated by the National Leadership Board in the fall 2024. 2026, yes, sorry. Yes. Excuse me just for a moment, if I may. Uh, I, I would just su suggest procedurally it's a little bit awkward because what we're doing is approving the amendment for something that we haven't yet approved. So I think what we need to do is approve the concept first, uh, and then we would need to probably have a second motion that talks about reassessing. Yeah, we're, we, we're going to approve the amendment uh, first and then approve the motion as a, as, a, as a package with the amendment, okay? Sure. The amendment reads here, and that uh, let me read the whole the entire uh, motion. 
uh, recommend to implement a three-year cycle for CNBC annual gatherings. Two years would be held regionally across Canada and the third year a national gathering in one location and that the three-year cycle be evaluated by the members at the 2026 gathering. Questions? Yep, okay. And go ahead and vote. On, on the amendment, yes. The minutes will reflect the, the true so motion. This is just a motion on the amendment, then we'll vote on the motion together. He's opening the voting now. Yeah, you're good. Thank you, Jeff. Okay, so we have, uh, by a majority vote, have passed the amendment to the motion. All right. And now we are going to call for a vote on the motion itself with the amendment. Do I need any additional discussion or is that, that's good? Okay. All right, we appreciate the discussion. Almost felt like we weren't in a Baptist business meeting there for a bit. Everything is <laughs> going way too smooth. That's good. All right. I'm going to call JD up now. Uh, I'm just going to repeat uh, Victor what he said at the end. Uh, we laugh about it, but it's true. We need that. So thank you for participating. And, and I think we have a new, uh, a new motion that was approved. Uh, that is something that we need. We always need to evaluate. So thank you for participation. Uh, uh, I just want to call this meeting to adjourn. I need a motion on that. And I, didn't, I need a second on that. Uh, do I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? Uh, can you, yeah, can you come to the mic just for the live stream? This is Jason Johnson, Bow Valley Baptist. Um, the question that I have, and this is probably coming a lot from uh, maybe my ignorance of being new to the, the CNBC, and this is my first assembly, so I've been involved in other Baptist denominations. Um, and this is probably going to be an ongoing conversation, but my question probably has to do more about the processes of how um, decisions are made in terms of what motions and, and decisions belong in the assembly. For example, um, when we talk about the voting process in assembly and what we're responsible for, Maybe I'm thinking too much of the Carver model, but my understanding would be the decisions regarding even the cycles of the, um, the way that we meet together. I would understand that the three-year cycle 
and that whole decision would belong to the decision making of our new national leader. So my understanding would be that he is elected by this assembly to make those decisions. And so my question would be, I'm a little bit confused, is that a vote of ratification or of affirmation or is this a policy vote? Because if it's a policy vote, then I'm a little bit confused on yeah. what other strategic yeah. decisions need to come to us when I would assume that would belong in Jeff's hands. So yeah. this is more of just a question, but it's also a little bit of a, of a statement of going, I think we can maybe moving forward, I, I think good due diligence could be invested into deciding what are good, like true policy directional decisions that we have to make that belong here versus the strategic directional decisions yeah. that we've actually voted already to have yeah. Jeff make those. So just moving forward, it, it might be good to put some thought into that process, yeah. but I, I really appreciate what we're doing here. So yeah. thank you for your question. Actually, it, and it's not only a question, but it, it goes with clarification. Would you mind me speaking to yeah, that? Go ahead. So Jason, I appreciate that. Um, actually, it's not the executive director that has that power, but the National Leadership Board. And uh, so I make a recommendation to the National Leadership Board. The National Leadership, I made it twice, and they voted on it unanimously twice. And, uh, and so you're right, technically, this body doesn't, doesn't get into matters like this. That was my recommendation to not only have it um, go through our National Leadership Board twice, but bring it to the floor, understanding that's a risk, but also understanding that the nature of the thing that we're talking about affects everybody in this room. And so I really wanted this kind of discussion. So, so that's it, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. And, it, and, and as you said, it's not only a, a policy, but it, uh, it actually goes to the bylaws and, and every decision that the National Leadership Board makes, it comes to the floor as well for us to vote on that. So every decision that we are considering or we consider his, here this morning uh, came through the national leaderboard, uh, but at the same time, we're looking uh, for you, for the churches, and, and that's what we do. When, when we call uh, messengers for, from every church, uh, we send out uh, budgets, we send out every single detail that we're gonna have in the agenda for you messengers to review it and to come with our questions and, and to do what we need to do. So again, thank you for doing that because that's what we need uh, to make those decisions. I'm Bob Butt, uh, just wanna say the members or the messengers of the churches are the highest authority in the denomination. So yes. the National Leadership Board answers to the members yes. and the members vote at a gathered meeting like this. Yes. So that, that's how the order of um, hierarchy of authority would be arranged yep. in the denomination, according to my understanding. Yep. yep. And that's why we need the regions to be involved. So we already vote. And uh, let, let, let me call for, the, for uh, a motion to adjourn the meeting so we have you again. OK? <laughs> David Ferguson. Do we have a second to adjourn? Again? Elaine, thank you. Uh, everybody in favor, I'm just gonna ask you to raise your hand to adjourn the meeting. Do we need the electronically vote to have? Okay, let's, <laughs> let's vote, let's vote on your device. Why, why are you laughing about it? There's people that they want to stay here. Victor said it. This is a real Baptist voting. So thank you, voting. We're adjourned. All right. Motion passed. All right. We are going to move into lunch. Is anybody hungry? Okay. Uh, our CNBC staff has been hard at work getting lunch ready. We have hamburgers and a few hot dogs for the kiddos. Um, and they are, there's gluten-free to one side, okay? So gluten-free buns, gluten-free options, and veggie options, okay? All right. Um, hamburgers and hot dogs warmed. Um, so we, they're hot, they're ready to go. 
Um, we are going to, as soon as we begin starting that lineup here in just a moment, but Kathy is going to get us going here. Uh, we're going to start that lineup when that starts. Line up by this door, same as yesterday, please. And then we are going to set up some tables uh, and put chairs around those tables. So we have some staff that are going to help us, and Mike Bogland is going to uh, direct us in that. So if you could help us out with that, that would be wonderful. Kathy. Hi. So we're going to go ladies first, and ladies will take their lunch from the buffet line and join us in the fellowship hall. I was remembering a few year, years ago when we were back east, we had a ladies' lunch, and the men historically are responsible for the children at this time and so we were enjoying our lunch and all of a sudden we had 25 children at the window of the lunch and they were outside and there was no fathers and the fathers got talking in the hallway and forgot to keep the children in the middle of the conversation circles and they all escaped looking for moms and so part way through we were getting lots of knocks on the door. So dads, if you have children in the building today, you must pick them up from children's program. Don't lose sight of the children that you are responsible for for one hour while the ladies have a great time downstairs. Let's pray. Oh, <laughs> let's pray. Uh, Father, thank you. Thank you for just, well, the king, the kingdom, uh, that we get to participate in sharing the gospel everywhere we, we live and, and work. And, and Lord, it's, it's a privilege. Thank you for this time to connect, to encourage one another, to, to share and to just listen to you throughout this couple of days. Thank you for this food and just a special blessing on those who've just been working hard in the kitchen. We thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> 